to another edition of Free Association Radio, the Robert Phoenix Show. This is 15 Minutes of Flame, and I am Robert Phoenix, broadcasting to you live from South Central Texas, where, again, the weather has turned, going from a sublime 80 degrees yesterday to a rather coolish high 50s as we move into the weekend. How's everybody doing in this crazy world we're living in? the alternate reality known as the Trump verse. There's so much going on every single day. Every single day is a reporter's uh, news media wet dream. So in terms of ratings and viewership, uh, Trump has divorced himself from CNN, but there's plenty of news to report on. More so in some ways than during the Obama administration. I mean, look, we had the false flags. I will not miss the Obama false flags. Now, Trump may have his own version of false flags. We'll have to wait and see. But I won't miss the Obama false flags. What we saw last night in uh, Berkeley was no false flag. It was a real event. Um, Now, I don't know if the protesters, the about 150 sort of black bloc, um, uh, masked protesters were actually real. I don't. I don't know that. You know, we live at a time where we've got to be really, 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 really careful with pinning an association on certain people. It would be very easy to say that the anti-fascist fascists, or the communists, or whoever they are, are who they say they are or who they purport themselves to be, but there's a chance that they may may be not or may not be. I mean, they could be false opposition running around generating more angst and more radical energy, more revolutionary fervor. We don't know half the time. Those guys could be Mossad. They could be, um, see, you know, F, you know, FBI. I, you know, there's just so many possibilities. I mean, they could be who they purport themselves to be, which is a radical faction that is out there opposing Trump and Trump's policies. Now, if you don't know the story, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos was speaking in Berkeley last night, and he's this darling now of the alt-right because he's taken on uh, feminism, he's taken on racism, he's taken on uh, globalism, and not only is he a... uh, a witty and intelligent uh, vox for the alt-right. He also happens to be Jewish and gay. And he's often uh, claiming that he can't be racist because of all the black dick he's had in his mouth. I mean, on some level, I, 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 Milo kind of, kind of disgusts me, I have to say. But we're supposed to, like, champion him because he's – you know he he's a, he's a he's a a, a, a flamethrower for for free speech and anti PC thought, but I really think he's more of like a mind fuck to be honest with you, because you have to wrap your head around certain things that Milo stands for, and then certain things that Milo actually is, and you've got to do this kind of complex algebraic equation in your head and accept all of it, right? Because if you're into the ideology, you're into the ideology. And you look past certain things. He's a he's a funny guy. He's a smart guy. Um, he's was well known for you know going after this BBC reporter. I, I thought he was over the top with the BBC guy. I thought the BBC guy was just kind of you know was just asking him questions. And Milo was turning this into you're setting a trap for me. So I'm going to go one better, and I'm going to show you that you're setting the trap, and I'm going to spin this interview in my direction. Um, I agree with some of the things he says. I, I you know, I don't necessarily agree with some of the other things that, that uh, Milo sort of characterizes, but this is America and we are a country that theoretically allows free speech, no matter who it is and what they're doing. Now, the challenge with Milo, and this is all very orchestrated, um, 
you know, he, he works for Breitbart. So he's on the Breitbart payroll. And in my last piece that is up on my website, robertphoenix.com, very briefly, I mentioned the link between Breitbart and Israel. So there is a uh, connection there uh, between the, uh, our, our best friend, uh, in the, our good friend in the Middle East, and uh, Breitbart in the alt-right. So Milo is connected to uh, quite possibly the Mossad or uh, Israeli intelligence. I mean, Breitbart's got an office in Tel Aviv, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? I think I'm right. Anyway, so here we have Milo uh, walking around doing his tour on U.S. campuses. And look, I think that the ideology inside of the universities in the United States has become completely fixed, stuck, frozen. And if you do not uh, parrot the party line, um, there's a good chance you won't get advanced degrees. If you're uh, looking to get a Ph.D., and you're not touting uh, progressivism, globalism, multiculturalism, diversity, internationalism, if you're not touting and working within the structure and the framework of those ideologies, uh, you're, it's going to be fairly difficult for professors to pass you. And the reason why is that they don't want a proliferation of thinkers and professors who are proposing different lines of thoughts, moving away from the collectivist mindset. They don't want to do that. So in many instances, universities have, have you know, fallen into or, or, or been placed into an ideological lockdown. So Milo Yiannopoulos is somebody that comes along and he's like a nitroglycerin that's going to explode on a campus in the United States, and he's going to get vilification. He's going to get scorn. And it doesn't matter whether he's liberal in his attitude and lifestyle and conservative in his thinking. It doesn't matter because in those places, he's considered a threat and dangerous, dangerous to the proliferation of the pablum of ideas that have been circulated through American campuses since the mid 60s when Michel Foucault uh, became the philosopher du jour of the um, of the intellectuals I used to live in Berkeley I, I you know I've I've seen I've seen things in Berkeley but Berkeley has not been a radical campus for years for years Berkeley had a, a time in the 60s where it was protest central. And then uh, the demographics at Berkeley changed. And Berkeley is populated by a lot of international students and a lot of Asian students. So the political character of the university became, uh, to a large degree, more conservative. Now, you're not going to find conservative think tanks at Berkeley, like you might at Stanford with the Hoover Institute, that's a, that's a whole different, you know, kind of animal. But I would say that um, socioeconomically, that the student body has become much more toned down and conservative in terms of their day-to-day uh, -day practice of ideology. But clearly, last night that was not the case, and the students that were on campus who were protesting, were apparently protesting peacefully. There was another group who came in and set the place on fire. And so we're, we're seeing the stage now, uh, or starting to see the, the, the set be constructed for a civil war in the United States, or at the very least, a series of conflagrations that continue to escalate to the point where something will be done. And that something will not be pleasant, I can assure you. I can absolutely assure you. So, again, I'm playing the role of a devil's advocate here uh, because I have to. And if you're the Trump administration and you want to inflame 
the vitriol and the opposition, maybe you'd be invested through your partners, so to speak, in creating a situation like what happened last night in Berkeley. I'm, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but we have to look at these things from as many different angles as possible. And if it's just the left and it's just the left uh, venting, the far left venting their radical fervor, then that's, that, it, that is what it is, and it's not going to go away, and we're going to see more of it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the Trump travel ban, because I wasn't able really to cover that over the last couple of days since I've been um, out of pocket. Um, I think it's a really weak effort on Trump's part to create a travel ban amongst a number of countries who are probably not going to be sending people, you know, over domestic airlines. Just, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. You know, if you're Libya, are you really going to send, you know, your worst terrorists over, you know, a, a UAL flight to the United States? I don't, I don't think so. And even the countries that Trump banned, he left three countries out that were vitally important. He left out Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Why no travel ban with those countries? You know, this is, this is when Trump's credibility, and I know there are a lot of you out there that, that like Trump, and a lot of you out there don't like Trump. I like certain things about Trump, certain things. I don't like everything. And I could probably do a whole hour show based on that. And one of the things that I don't like is that there's some selectivity here. If you're going to, if you're going to do a travel ban, throw it, you know, move it with the Saudis. I mean, the Saudis are one. I mean, <laughs> they harbor most of the terror in the Middle East. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to ban that country? And Afghanistan, Pakistan, well, especially Afghanistan, it just makes it makes no sense. I mean, I really think that what Trump has done is he's hit the travel ban for countries that have um, those you know, visa employees for the Silicon Valley. That's what I think. I think this is more about cutting off the uh, H-1A visas so that Silicon Valley will have to hire, quote, unquote, more Americans. I could be totally wrong, but, you know, who, was the, who, who spoke out vehemently early on against us? It was the likes of Google and all the other cats in the Silicon Valley, Facebook, because they need these people. They need these people to help them run their enterprises. They don't have them. They're, then they're screwed. Google immediately ordered, you know, all of its employees home. They didn't want to lose them. They're like, look, we need you. Get here. Don't hesitate. So if, if Trump is trying to change the tide in that direction, which he might actually be attempting to do, then perhaps that was actually a very KG smart move on his part. But as a ban for travel, as a ban for terrorism, it was clunky, ham-fisted, and I don't think very effective. If you wanted to smoke out the opposition and find more and more people that were opposed to your ideas, perfect. Perfect. Look, we're dealing with people here that are cagey. They're smart. They're sophisticated. I was listening to an interview last night with Catherine Austin Fitz, which I highly recommend. Um, I'm going to put it up. I'm going to put the link up on my Facebook page. And Jeff Rance interviews Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine Austin Fitz has uh, been involved in a number of administrations. She's about as close as you get to a free market libertarian with some uh, association with um, more kind of mainstream monetary policies. She's kind of a hybrid. She's really great, very bright. And what I was able to glean, and I'll give you the, the bullet points from that interview, uh, is that, number one, globalism was failing because there was a drag on the purchasing of goods 
in countries outside of the United States. So in essence, globalism could not support itself. This is what was going on. Now, they realized that what they had to do is they had to rebuild the middle class of the United States in order to keep the global economy game going. And this is what Trump has been charged to do. That he is here to build up the middle class. He's here to uh, sustain and buttress the middle so that the, glo the, the global economic interests can begin to profit and prosper again because those markets overseas were dying, absolutely dying. And he's got a limited time to do it. And one of the things that Catherine Austin Fitz talks about is she talks about that the struggle now becomes a struggle between humanity and synthetic humanity. And I've been, I've been saying this for years. And it's not just AI and the ultimate competition that we'll face with AI. It's actually about RFID chips and monetary, personal, political, psychic, physical control. She talks about this in this interview. It's actually quite interesting. And one of the things she says is she says that, um, that Trump is aware of this, and he doesn't want his son or his grandkids to have to be chipped, which is one of the reasons why he's gotten involved. So he has been tasked with turning the Titanic. That's what she says. She's labeled Trump a Titanic turner. And this is just on the, on the economic side, on the monetary side. Now, um, a couple of people on Facebook have asked me to talk about the Constitutional Convention, because now there's a buzz. Oh, we need a Constitutional Convention. We've got to change some things. Um, I would say that we need to just nip that in the bud and um, kill it. Kill it before it gets any kind of life, animation, or traction. We have a Constitution. Yes, that document exists. And the key here is to live and govern closer to the tenets of the Constitution, the original Constitution. We do that, then, then with all those checks and balances and everything that's set up inside of there, we can have a system that is probably the best for governance that's been created throughout history. Again, kind of this distillation of the Magna Carta and some other, other documents, but nonetheless, it is a living, breathing document that still exists today and still has some merit, even though the Patriot Act is sort of sitting on top of the Constitution. Patriot Act, if Trump could do something really radical in that Sun-Gemini conjunction fashion, he'd repeal the Patriot Act. That's what he'd do. Because once you repeal the Patriot Act, then you're dealing with the Constitution. You're not dealing with this prophylactic that's been slipped on top of it. But that's exactly what we have. So it'll be interesting. The thing you're going to get with Trump, and I said this before, I'll say it again. The thing you're going to get with Trump is that you're going to get some policies that are going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to nod your head and go, yep, good. TPP, yep, good. Like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you get something else, you'll shake your head the other way and go, wow, what is this? What is this about? And this, this is going to happen. It's, it's, so it's going to be, it's going to be a bit conflicted, kind of like Neil Yiannopoulos, kind of conflicted about, you know, what he stands for and all, you know. So there's this inborn confliction, even, <clears throat> even when you go down into, like the, you know, the real bowels of, you know, alternative research, and you look at Trump's connection. Uh, through his son and all the power players on his side of the of the field and their connection to uh, our good friend in the Middle East and how Trump again and again and again talks about the dancing Saudis. Well, this, this is an interesting piece. 
right? I mean, he talked about this. He made a big deal about this over and over again during his campaign. It wasn't the dancing Saudis. They were dancing Israelis. They were dancing Israelis. I mean, it's been proven, absolutely proven. But this is a meme that Trump has been uh, basically instructed to drill into the heads of people. Now, if that's true, then why wouldn't he ban Saudis on the travel list? If, if he is convinced that Saudi Arabia did 9-11, why are they allowed to travel? This is, you see, these are the inconsistencies that when you get down into the pits and into the trenches with Trump, you just shake your head and go, what the hell, you know, who, who, you know this guy is, you know, he's, he's been put in place. But then you go into some of the other stuff, and then you realize that, well, he's actually doing something. And some of these things and some of the, some of the actions, some of the thoughts are very real, profound, crystal clear. I watched him during the uh, press conference for Black History Month. He, and he worked that room like it was a boardroom. And he had all these African-Americans, men and women, who were engaged in either some form of um, relationship with their church, some, some form of some kind of group or organization that was doing some kind of outreach, or they're in the media. And he gave each and every one of them their kind of time, a lot of time, and you know, greeted each and every – and he did it with a sense of warmth. I mean, there was, there was nothing disingenuous about Trump in that moment. It was fascinating to watch. Absolutely fascinating. When he says, you know, we've got to, you know, get into the inner cities and, and you know, essentially rebuild and bring an economic pulse to the inner cities, he's not lying. He's, he's not giving these people lip service like the, like the Democrats have. I can tell. I understand where congruity is in a person. I saw it in that moment. So we're going to get certain things with Trump that will be interesting or agreeable. It's like, yeah, 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 he's going after his mandate. This is what's going to happen. This make, he's making it happen. But on the other hand, you drill down and you see certain things or he says something stupid or you know, he's going to have a travel ban, which really when you look at it isn't really the most effective travel ban out there. Then you're like, eh, well, what about this? And then you're back on the other side of the laundry sheet. Well, what about this? 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 And there you go. That is Trump in a nutshell. Sun, Uranus, conjunction, Gemini. But what we're doing here is we're breaking up patterns. We're breaking up patterns that have been in place since the, the mid-60s. This is what's going on. He's the great disruptor. And out of this, he needs to turn the economy around. This is the last chance, by the way. If he does not turn the economy around, if he does not produce jobs, number one, he'll be out of a presidency. And number two, um, we're going to be at the behest of a global reset like you've never seen. And it will include the chip. So if you're anti-chip, you should be pro-Trump. That's my that's my take rate, my two cents. Okay. Now I promised that we would talk a little bit about Ashley Judge chart. I've got about five minutes left. And I'm probably gonna do a post on this because it is so rich and so rife with material and content. Ashley Judd <laughs> Amazing. Um she exploded, bloated onto our consciousness at the Million Woman March. Clearly the most radical, clearly the most, in some ways, yang and male participant at that event. If you look at Ashley Judd's chart, let me give you the rundown here. And then a lot of you out there are into astrology, follow astrology. Chiron, Aries, Venus, Aries, Saturn, Aries, True Node, Aries, Mercury, Aries, Sun, Aries. One, two, three, four planets in Aries. 
one planetoid in one aspect, and they're all in the eighth house. How long has she been sitting on that time bomb? She's not only a nasty woman. I can tell you right now, this is an angry woman, very angry. She, the only water she has on her chart is Neptune. And Neptune is in Scorpio, down at the bottom of her chart. That's it. There, there's, she is all pretty much fire. Fire and Earth, she's volcanic. Leo rising, Jupiter and Leo on the first house cusp. Mars in, in Taurus on the midheaven. Mars. So even Mars, the placement of Mars, right? You know, dead center, almost 12 noon, dominates her chart. Absolutely dominant. So Mars, Aries, dominates her chart. Jupiter retrograde, uh, Leo, you know, getting out there in front of the crowd, kind of blowing up. Uh, Moon in Aquarius, you know, very eccentric, detached, cool, radical moon. Radical moon. So her, her moon was kind of coming into alignment with the new moon right around that time. And then she has a Uranus Pluto conjunction in the first house in Virgo. So again, you get that radical element with Uranus, Pluto, and tense, but there's no water in the chart. She's got a sextile with the moon. So it's a wide sextile. Um, she's got sextiles of Pluto and Uranus, but those, those aren't personal, not personal at all. Uh, opposition to the midheaven. But it's really all these, um, all these planets in Aries. You know, there's square, a lot of them are squaring her moon. And she's, got, she's got issues with her mother. But remember, she's a half-sister of Winona Judd. Naomi Judd's her mother. So Naomi Judd had a, had a, a daughter, a.k.a. Ashley, with, with another guy who is a separate father than Winona. And Winona kind of said she's not into it. She's not into politics. She's into music, and she wasn't, she wasn't really down with what her sister had to say. Black Moon Lilith, zero degrees Taurus, one of the most ancient moons on the planet, that zero degrees Taurus. Uh, she talks about being an angry woman. That woman is channeling some archetypal and collective anger. It's a harsh chart. It's not an easy chart, I'll tell you right now. Not an easy chart at all. So I'll do a more uh, uh, concise, in some ways, breakdown of the Ashley Judd chart later on my, on my site. Well, that's it for today's 15 Minutes of Flame. Stay nimble. Stay on your toes. You know, be really clear as to what's going on and try to decipher and move within the realm of polarity and duality, not get too stuck on either end of the spectrum. And always speak your truth. It's Robert Phoenix. This has been your 15 Minutes of Flame. Happy New Year from all of us at Randall's. Let us help your family have better health and wellness in 2017. Randall's is a preferred pharmacy for select Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas plans, helping members save money on certain prescriptions. Need a new pharmacy? With our professional, friendly service and ability to accept most insurance, let us be your new prescription provider. Fill a new or transfer prescription with us and get a $25 gift card. Transferring is easy. Some limitations apply. Ask our friendly pharmacist for details. Randall's Pharmacy, proudly serving Texas families since 1966. 